Hi everyone, my name is Steph Simpson. I'm the Coastal Wetland Program Manager for the Nature Conservancy. I've been working on blue carbon for the past six or seven years now, previously with Restore America's Estuaries and now with TNC. As part of this role, I support the inclusion of tidal wetlands in climate policies, and I work to develop market tools and resources and develop pilot projects to connect to carbon finance. I also work to just increase the general awareness of the climate mitigation power of blue carbon. So today I will be talking about developing a blue carbon offset project, Lessons Learned. However, as I started to pull together these slides, I realized that what I should really be talking about is lessons learning. Blue carbon is still such a new field and pilot projects are still just now getting off the ground. So there's still a lot to learn and I'll continue to learn as we go but I am excited to share with you progress that we've made so far and lessons that we've learned as we're getting these first few projects off the ground. But first things first, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page, that when I say blue carbon, I'm referring to the greenhouse gases stored in, sequestered by, and released by vegetated coastal systems. So tidal marsh, seagrass, and mangroves. And the reason we limit blue carbon to these three systems for now is because how and where they store carbon. Although they take up a smaller area than terrestrial forests, sequestration is occurring at a faster pace, burying carbon into the ground. And it's this underground burial where the bulk of that carbon storage is happening. Because these habitats are wet, decomposition is happening very slowly. So you could have significant carbon stores in their soils. And you can see from this graphic on the right that these coastal habitats can take up to 10 times as much carbon into their soils each year than forests. And this carbon can remain locked up for thousands of years or more as long as the habitat remains healthy. And this blue carbon mitigation value provides us with some new opportunities to elevate the importance of tidal wetlands, adding value to our work. We can use this value to incorporate tidal wetlands into climate policies and frameworks. We can use it as an additional metric for ecosystem health. And we can connect to new projects and donors who are interested in natural climate solutions and market incentives. And it's this last point that's the focus of the body of work I'm presenting on today. Now the voluntary carbon market is a growing market, which has generated more than $2 billion globally to support forest carbon projects. And our objective with blue carbon projects is to help coastal wetlands access a piece of this carbon finance pie. So for perspective, I'll start with a little bit of an overview of what this market even looks like. So when I talk about markets, I'm referring to the voluntary carbon market, not to be confused with emerging regulatory markets that we see in countries and even states across the globe. The voluntary carbon market, as the name suggests, is voluntary, and it's a place where it's a global market where companies, governments, and individuals can purchase carbon offsets to reduce their carbon footprint. The purchase of, that, of those offsets then go back to the projects that generated them, and these projects can be a wide variety of types, from forestry to renewable energy. Anything that can capture atmospheric greenhouse gas or prevent the release of gas of these gases can generate carbon offsets with the right enabling conditions. For example, a tidal wetland project that's restoring a degraded system can earn credits by generating carbon credits from capturing carbon from, through normal plant photosynthesis, but also from stopping the release of carbon as systems degrade and that stored carbon can be released back into the atmosphere. Now the marketplace is overseen by carbon standards and these are nonprofit organizations that set up the accounting procedures and project requirements to ensure transparency and sound science back every carbon offset. These standards also track credits to assure no double counting. There are a number of standards out there Three of the more popular ones are the ones I just popped up on the screen, the Verified Carbon Standard, Gold Standard, and American Carbon Registry. There are more, but these are just a few to give into some examples. So in order to generate offsets on the voluntary carbon market, you must use a standard approved methodology or protocol to follow for your greenhouse gas accounting. Over the past few years, we've seen the creation of such methodologies specifically for tidal wetland activities. Here are a few that are available. One in particular that I'll focus on for today is the one bolded here, the Global Tidal Wetland and Seagrass Restoration Methodology, which was approved by VCS, the Verified Carbon Standard. And it allows for a wide variety of restoration activities and vegetated coastal wetlands worldwide, and is the methodology that we're using for our first blue carbon offset pilot project. From there, the process looks like this. 
Once you have a project site or group of sites and activities identified, you first conduct a feasibility study. This collects what information is available for your project to estimate the potential carbon offsets and revenue that can be generated. And also it starts to identify what knowledge gaps, science gaps, or legal considerations need to be taken into account. With this information, project developers can decide whether or not it makes sense for them to develop their project as a carbon offset project. If yes, then a project description document builds off this feasibility study. It details all of those project site or sites and their activities and the greenhouse gas accounting and monitoring procedures. It also talks about land tenure and carbon rights and basically shows that the project developers are following an approved methodology for the greenhouse gas accounting. This document must then be validated by a standard approved third party. Next comes the monitoring report, which details the project monitoring for a given time period, accounting for those offsets that will be generated. This document must also be verified by a standard approved third party. Once those documents have been approved according to standard procedures, offsets can be generated and then sold. So how do we get to that stage of blue carbon project development? In order to develop a project, we need the right enabling conditions. We need to have a methodology for the set of project activities that we're looking for, in our case, coastal wetland restoration. Then we need to identify the project site where there is ongoing or planned activities, since we can go back five years to generate carbon credits from existing projects. Next, we need the right data and, of course, an engaged team on the ground. Now that we have the methodologies in place, our next step was to find the sites for our pilot projects and show the proof of concept here. Now we're working in a number of sites to pilot these carbon methodologies, but the place I will talk about today is a project site in coastal Virginia, as this is the furthest along and has shed light on the project development process. So a little bit of background first for this project. So we're working with a TNC, the TNC field team at the Virginia Coast Reserve. Since 2008, this team and a number of partners in the area, including the Virginia Institute for Marine Science, or VIMS, and the University of Virginia have been researching and restoring eelgrass. Eelgrass habitat was virtually all lost in the 1930s in the Bay due to noxious slime mold and devastating storms. But as conditions in the Bay improved, scientists at VIMS realized it was right time to start restoring. So over the past decade, TNC has coordinated volunteer help to work alongside VIMS and others to plant eelgrass in the bay. This work has been such a huge success that we thought it would be a great place to pilot blue carbon offsets, adding value to the work and generating offsets hopefully for the last five years of work and on into the future. Another reason this site was a good fit is the existing partnerships on the ground. VIMS monitors the eelgrass beds every year with aerial imagery and data analysis. And graduate students and professors at the University of Virginia have been sampling eelgrass to quantify the carbon stores there. All in all, making this an ideal location and group of partners to work with for our first blue carbon offset project. So where are we now in this process? We completed the feasibility study in 2019 and are now in the project description and monitoring report phase, working to establish a project start date in 2015 and quantify the first set uh, our first round of offsets generated over the past five years. So we're combining these two steps and working on them concurrently, which can be the case um, often enough, especially in land use projects. Now this project in Virginia is small, but it has been immensely valuable in providing insight as we work our way, our way through applying the methodology and the market process. So to share some of the initial challenges we faced, of course the funding I think in every project is a big challenge, always finding the funding. Even though we have investors lined up to purchase blue carbon offsets, there is sometimes there's just less interest in providing the upfront capital needed to develop a project. Thankfully, we had an investor ready to go for both, for providing that upfront support for research and for project development, along with other partners to help support the work along the way. Namely, AXA XL as our private industry and main funding partner, but also Restore America's Estuaries and the Ocean Foundation and our TNC Global Climate, uh, climate Program. It also helped that the restoration has been at a fairly lower cost, using volunteers to do much of the seed harvesting and planting, and established partnerships continue to provide the research and the monitoring. Next was legal hurdles. As the eelgrass project takes place on Virginia state lands, we needed state support, not only for developing the project, but we also needed to make sure the state had the authority to participate in the market. 
Now, there was no legal conditions prohibiting the state from doing so, but we all would be going to feel better if there was um, strict authority saying they could do, they could participate in the market. So our TNC legal experts at the Virginia chapter worked with the state to introduce language explicitly granting the state of Virginia and specifically the Department of Environmental Quality to participate in carbon markets. We also had the right enabling conditions as the political climate in Virginia is supportive of addressing climate change and promoting natural climate solutions. So the measure was passed earlier this year. And lastly, timing. As with many projects, not just carbon markets, delays happen. We've had to deal with weather delays, COVID delays, and, and data delays. So patience is really key, but also having a great field team and partners who are supportive and engaged to keep momentum going. So some of the key takeaways that I'll share to wrap up is that it's critical to have a supportive team on the ground. As you can see, st the strong partnerships have really made this, uh, made this project happen, especially in that the MRV was already established and we're working with FEMS to align our monitoring plan with their existing MRV plans. It's also important to have um, that government support. Whether or not your project is occurring on government-owned land, which was the case with us, it's important to have that political will and, and government-level um, government support along the way as well. But you'll see the common denom denominator here is it's the people who make the project happen and happen successfully. Probably not new information to a lot of you. So as I wrap up, I want to offer a wider picture of this work as we continue to develop projects, not just this one in Virginia, but ones across Latin America, the Caribbean, and hopefully many other places across the globe. Market projects, as you can tell, take time and a longer view of project planning. In my experience though, oftentimes restoration work is done piecemeal and the longer term management and monitoring aspects are not well-funded or don't have many resources. Market projects force a long-term view with long-term commitments from landowners, and with financial planning beyond just the restoration activity. And those plans must include climate related impacts like sea level rise because these offsets must be permanent for at least 100 years. This means that market projects are planned from the get go to be sustained long term for the benefit of the ecosystem, but also for the people involved. And to me, this is the real big game changer for carbon offset projects. So I'm excited to see these first few pilot projects get off the ground and even more excited to scale this work to achieve a larger impact globally for our coastal wetlands and for the communities that depend on them. So I thank you for taking an interest in this work and I hope, I hope I've been able to share some uh, important or at least interesting lessons that we've been learning along the way. Thanks.